Welcome to the uh, fifth and final part of our series on the history of Ukrainians. My name is Roman Onofrychuk, or Roman Onofrychuk, depending which language I'm speaking. Uh, over the last four programs, we've dealt with the history of the Ukrainians from, I guess, the Neolithic up to the present, up until 1991, which was when the uh, Ukrainians in Ukraine declared their independence. Uh, today, what I'd like to deal with is what I think we call the diaspora, or the scatterment. Uh, the history of the Ukrainians who live beyond the borders of Ukraine. People such as myself in Canada, people in the States, and so on. The point of departure, of course, for all these people uh, was Ukraine. Uh, the immigrations from Ukraine began as early, I suppose, as 1709. That was the first political immigration out of Ukraine. Those were the people who had supported Hetman Mazepa in his attempt to break Ukraine away from Peter of Russia. Uh, when he left and went to Moldova, people followed him. We consider them among the first of the political immigrations. But early immigrations began out of Ukraine probably toward the end of the 1700s. And what these were, these were immigrations that went eastward. They were people who moved into Siberia and out to the Pacific coast uh, of what was then the Russian Empire. And especially in the 1800s, large populations moved uh, continuously eastward out to a place that is called Zeleny Klen, or Green Maple, where to this day there are large Ukrainian populations. I was at a conference, a folkloric conference, and they told us that those people, um, while they no longer speak the Ukrainian language, they still sing Ukrainian songs. So there's a, a large population of Ukrainians living on the east coast uh, of, uh, of the Pacific. In addition to that, there used to be a very large population in Manchuria, in China, but the immigrations that I suppose we know most about are the immigrations that began in the middle of the last century and that headed, instead of eastward, headed westward. Uh, these immigrations, the first ones to leave Ukraine, headed mainly for South America. Uh, large populations moved to Brazil and Argentina. Uh, they were promised good land, they were promised good opportunities. But as it turned out, in fact, the, uh, the populations that moved to South America were to find that they were living in conditions that were worse than those which they lived in still in Ukraine. And to this day, those populations, in, especially in Argentina and Brazil, are among the poorest Ukrainian populations uh, in the world. And Ukrainian communities in the States and in Canada uh, operate relief effort to help them out. In many ways, those people find themselves in living conditions not unlike those that made them leave Ukraine in the first place. Probably the best known of the immigrant groups are the immigrations that ended up in Europe and that ended up in North America. And of course, the, uh, probably the best established of all the immigrant groups uh, is the Canadian one. There are approximately 1.5 million Ukrainian Canadians in Canada. Uh, and that's to a population of about 25 million Canadians. There are about as many Ukrainian Americans, about 1.5 million, but that's of course in the context of 250 million Americans. But the, the Ukrainians that came to Canada have a rather unique status among all the pioneer or all the Ukrainian immigrant groups in the sense that they have, or they were, the first immigration that came here, uh, are considered pioneers. They played a large role in opening up the Canadian prairie. And we'll talk mainly about that, that group of people. The first immigrations to go to North America were mainly from the Transcarpathian region of Ukraine. They were people who settled mainly in the Steel Belt in northeastern United States of America and were mainly urban populations. But the first farming populations to leave Ukraine left Ukraine in the late 1800s. And as a matter of fact, this is the year of their centennial, the coming uh, to Canada. They came here mainly looking for land, uh, and it's their story that, that I propose to end uh, this series on. The first immigration that came here uh, came mainly from Bukovina and from Halicina, or Galicia and Bukovina. Bukovina is down in here, and Galicia is in this area right here. And again, the conditions in these areas uh, of uh, south and western Ukraine at the turn of the century were among probably the worst uh, historically f uh, that Ukrainians had to put up with. Uh, this was, at that time, this part of Ukraine was in, uh, par as part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And just to give you a context of what these people faced in terms of the kind of conditions they lived under, this is in Ukraine. Uh, 
Number one, they lived in grinding poverty, uh, extremely poor. They, the population in Western Ukraine ate about one half as much as the rest of the population in the then Austro-Hungarian Empire. They had a lower standard of living than anybody in the empire. Uh, we figure about 50,000 of them died annually from malnutrition. And they were probably the most deeply in debt. The area itself was overpopulated, it had been overpopulated for a long time. Uh, even though they had the highest infant mortality rate, it was still a heavily overpopulated area, much disease and the least amount of medical attention. Now in addition to that, uh, the Ukrainian custom in that part of Ukraine was to divide land equally among the children, which meant that everybody got a piece of the land, but with each successive generation, the amount of land you had got successively smaller. Uh, in addition to that, land was in the hands of landowners who, hold, who owned large tracts of land. Um, fields were scattered around villages, which is a real problem because you have to then plow with horses. Uh, and horses are more difficult to maintain than oxen, for example. But the way the fields were situated around the villages, you had to have fast transportation to get from field to field. So more demand on the farmer. Also, there was intense national and linguistic oppression. Uh, Fewer acres, higher taxes, if you will. Military conscription, military conscription was at 18 years. Uh, military conscription lasted 20 years, which if they took you at 18 and you had to serve till you were 38, life expectancy was about 40. So the situation was not good. Uh, wood for construction and for burning was scarce, so it was difficult to heat the home. In addition to that, the ruling class, the people who really governed the Ukrainians, were all foreigners. Depending on where you were in the empire, they were either uh, they were either Poles or they were Hungarians, and so on. Education was pretty much out of reach, and it was denied by the system. And as a result, people had a very low self-perception. In addition to that, drinking was a problem. There was one tavern for every 233 Galicians. So uh, absolutely no problem if the intent was to, to drink your troubles away. So the, the period, the, the situation was extremely difficult. and. There was a real desire to see things change. The intelligentsia, which is to say the educated, had started a movement called the Prasvita movement, which means the Enlightenment. And this was made up of reading halls and community centers where people would meet, uh, whoever was literate would read the newspaper to the rest. And it was the Prasvita movement that had a lot to do with the fact that Ukrainians would immigrate to Canada. Uh, one of the representatives of this movement, a man by the name of Yosef Oleskiv, was sent by the Prasvita, uh, Prasvita movement to check on conditions in Brazil. And what he saw terrified him. He, uh, he promptly returned to Ukraine and, and advised everybody not to go to Brazil and opened a correspondence with the Sifton government. Now, meanwhile, in Canada, the CPR was going through. A Canadian government was very interested in opening the prairies. And uh, while casting about for likely farmers, good solid stock, uh, Sifton hit on the idea of Central and Eastern Europeans, and particularly the Galicians. So Oleskiv opened up uh, correspondence. He was invited to Canada by the Canadian government. He took them up on the invitation, came to Canada, had a look at the prairies, came back to Ukraine and wrote a book called O Immigrazi, or in other words, about the immigration. And it was on the basis of this book and Oleskiv's trip to Canada that the first waves of immigrants began to come here. Now, Oleskiv imagined this immigration to take place in a very orderly manner. He imagined that it would be very well organized, the procedure would probably be involved, and self-sufficient bands of people or groups of people would start to come to Canada. Well, of course, the thing got out of hand. <laughs> it got out of hand because rumors were going around that Canada was you know, made of gold and there was gold in every street in the, in the country. Uh, people who had gone earlier had written letters and said that you've got to come to, uh, you've got to, come to Canada because it's, it's very good, people were overplaying it, and it became a bit of a rush. Well, in that rush, approximately 170,000 Ukrainians came to the prairies. Um, the first ones, it might, might have been as many as 200,000, we, we aren't really sure, because when they came over, the Canadian government didn't, or the Dominion government of the day, did not recognize a category like Ukrainians. So they came over registered either as Galicians, they came over registered as Ruthenians, they came over registered as Austrians, they came over registered as Hungarians. But we, we estimate between 170,000 and 200,000 came in that first immigration. That immigration began in 1891, 
and it ended sometime around 1910. So it's that 20 year period. Now, what, what the Canadian government wanted to do was to situate these people in the southern prairie. They were looking at Winnipeg through Calgary as a potential place to situate them. But the Ukrainians uh, took one look at this land and said that this wasn't what they wanted. Uh, even though the north, which is the parkland, and here I'm, all I'm thinking about is you take, uh, you take a tack and a piece of string and you push it into Winnipeg and then take that string and hold it at diagonal to Edmonton, you get a band, which is a sort of a north northwestern band, and that's the parkland area. So running from Winnipeg through Roblin, Yorkton, Saskatchewan, up into Saskatoon through the North Battlefords, up into the Edmonton area. That area, called the parkland, was much more appealing to the Ukrainians for two reasons. One, there was water, and two, there were trees. And where they had lived, uh, trees were a problem. So even though it was back-breaking work to open those prairies, that's the area that they, uh, that they chose. Now, what, what was being offered to them? Well, if they came to Canada, they needed about two to three hundred dollars to do this. Uh, they were given 160 acres uh, for ten dollars, and all they had to do was they had to live and work on that land. Now, for the average peasant, that was probably something in the order of 20 to 30 times more land than he had had in his life. So it was a, it was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, there was a lot of efforts made by the, by the Canadian government to get Ukrainians to come. They hired shipping agents, uh, in, uh, mainly in Germany. And these people were paid by the head. So, you know, so many dollars for the head of the family and so many dollars for uh, every other member of the family. They really did their work in Ukraine. They probably misled some people. They were bogus agents. Uh, for example, people were not told that uh, their passage included meals. So they ended up paying shipping companies extra for meals. Some people got sick on the voyage. Some people actually died on the voyage. Uh, but they, they began to come, and they began to come in large quantities. Uh, they arrived in Montreal, usually, were checked for communicable diseases and all that sort of thing at the immigration pens. Then by train, usually to Winnipeg, Manitoba, where they were allowed to uh, leave their families in immigration halls, and the men folk went off to find their piece of land. Uh, arrival was a jolt, and for some, they, some wanted to go back, some never really adjusted, and some adjusted quite well to the new conditions. One of the things that made it such a jolt, these people lived in villages with their, their farmland around the village. So as, as a culture, they were extremely gregarious people, uh, used to living close to one another. When they came to Canada, of course, the situation was entirely different. Uh, the land was divided into a grid, and people were put on homesteads, usually about a mile apart. And for people who are used to living close to one another, this, this was really isolation. And incidentally, if, if you live anywhere in Canada other than Vancouver, or where we are recording this, you know that that climate in this country can be demanding, and especially on the prairies where you can get, you know, remembering my childhood days in Winnipeg, Manitoba, the bright blue sky, with a wind of about, uh, what shall we say, 60, 70 kilometers an hour and temperatures of minus 40. I mean, that's pretty demanding climate to have to, to, have to adjust to. Um, in addition to that, there was a lot of isolation in the sense that in the winters, the men folk would usually go out to find work, in, usually in the forests, to have cash. Uh, the women folk would stay behind with the children. When they first arrived, before they could build, build a house, they built sod houses called a bourde. Uh, which are in fact very warm, but uh, as soon as they could, they began building their communities. Now, one of the largest, one, or their houses, but one of the largest areas to receive a block settlement as such was the area northeast of Edmonton. As a matter of fact, that is called the block settlement. Uh, and places like Edna, Star, uh, in Smoky Lake, for example, a number of families came from the village Toporivtsi, which is in Bukovina, down in here. They, uh, they so liked the Smoky Lake area, they wrote back, so that's the Bukovina area down in here, to Porivtsi. They liked it so much, they wrote uh, to their families and friends in Toporivtsi, in Bukovina, and said this place is wonderful, and almost, uh, I think it's something like a couple of hundred families from that village all moved to the Smoky Lake area and became sort of the basis of that community. As soon as they could, they began building churches. As soon as they could, they began building halls.
By 1910, the Anglo-French reaction began against them. Uh, for example, Edmonton's Bulletin and the Winnipeg Nor'wester openly expressed racist views. By 1900, uh, they were, it was, uh, as I have a quote here, it was widely predicted that Ukrainians would become a serious social menace, lazy, unproductive, filthy, immoral, etc. these men in sheepskin coats. Well, I guess we didn't become that much of a social menace in Canada. Uh, somehow we seem to manage to do all right. Uh, what should be known is that when the First World War broke out, Ukrainians were suspect because so many of them, in fact, had immigrated from what had been the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And a number of Ukrainians, in fact, were interned uh, during the First World War. Uh, they lost, when they had their voting rights, these were suspended during the war. And in fact, the Canadian government didn't acknowledge the existence of this category of Ukrainians until after the First World War. So that was, that was the first immigration. The first immigration came here in a large block. They were, for the most part, farmers. They were people who were here to be pioneers, to open the land, and they represent sort of the core of the immigrations. Now, if you recall, in previous programs, I'd spoken about the, the run of events that took place in Ukraine following the First World War. There was that period when, between 1919 and 1921, the Ukrainians had declared their independence. They had been fighting with, uh, with the Russians. They had fought with the Germans. When the war ended, First World War, Western Ukraine became a protectorate of the Polish Commonwealth. And when the war ended, the Poles were very, very glad, in fact, to see Ukrainians again in expressing an interest in immigration. Uh, the western part of Ukraine was going to vote in a plebiscite in 1939 to decide whether or not they would remain a protectorate or whether, in fact, they would become totally integrated into Poland. And the Poles had begun a policy of uh, bringing Polish immigrants into western Ukraine anyway. So when the Ukrainians began to express an interest in immigration again, this was warmly received. And so during the period between the two wars, that is between the, uh, the First and Second World War, about 70,000 Ukrainians immigrated again from Ukraine, from Western Ukraine predominantly, into Canada. Now this, this immigrant group was substantially different from the first group. The first group had been rurally based, uh, they were farmers, they were pioneers. The second group was much better, much, much better educated. They were people who had lived through the struggles of the First World War and the uh, attempts at establishing the nation state. They, for the most part, found themselves more of an urban immigration. They uh, concentrated in cities like Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Toronto, and made an enormous contribution to the cultural and political and social life of the Ukrainian community. Uh, very soon after their arrival, the cultural life, which in fact had been already thriving with the first immigration, received a substantial boost. New organizations were formed, uh, and political and social life really began to develop among the Ukrainians in Canada. Now, that group would be, ex the population as such of Ukrainians in Canada would grow again, and it would grow after the Second World War. Now, what the Second World War brought with it was, as I told you before, a tremendous trauma. Uh, much of the F Second World War was fought in Ukraine between the Red Army and the Nazis. Now, what the F Nazis did when they arrived was they established local constabularies, and part of the role of the local constabulary was to decide who from the village would be shipped to Germany to be a worker. These were called Osterbeiters, Eastern workers. And quite often, whole families were deported from Ukraine to work in menial jobs and to work in industrial jobs in Germany during the Second World War. Now, when the war turned, when the war turned and the Germans began to retreat, those people ended up stuck, if you will, caught in Germany, uh, along with those Ukrainians who had been fleeing the Red Army. So what ended up during the Second World was, a, a, at the end of the Second World War, was a large Ukrainian population in Germany, some of whom had been deported there to work, some of whom had fled uh, westward trying to escape from the Soviets. Now, the two groups who found themselves there were people from western Ukraine who had been living under Polish occupation, and people from, that's rather people from western Ukraine, and people from eastern Ukraine who had already been living for whatever it was, the, two, the period between the two wars, 25 years or so, who had been living under the USSR. Now, when the war ended, the question became, where were these people to go? Now, if, if these people were from eastern Ukraine, 
quite often uh, they were returned to the Soviets. And incidentally, their fate, their fate was extremely unhappy because Stalin took the position that if you had left the USSR during the war, you were a traitor. Stalin did not recognize that there had been such a thing as an Osterbeiter. And quite often what happened, people were either summarily killed when they were returned to the Soviets, or were returned to the Soviets and then summarily shipped off into exile in Siberia for being collaborators with the Germans when that collaboration was in fact against their will. They were taken at gunpoint from their villages and homes to work in factories in Germany. People who had lived under the Polish occupation, however, were given the choice of being able to immigrate. And so about 35,000 of those people immigrated to Canada. Uh, now, they weren't the only ones in Ukraine, that 35,000 are quite a few more. They first lived in DP camps, and many of them ended up in Germany, in Belgium, in Great Britain, uh, some in Spain, and some in France. Though there had been already a French, I mean, a, a Ukrainian French community as early as the First World War. Uh, a lot of expatriates and people who had been involved politically in the Ukrainian Republic 1919 1921. So the last large immigration came to Canada. Uh, after 1949, made up of about 35,000 people. Again, very similar to the second immigration insofar as these were people who were, for the most part, much better educated. Uh, there was a large contingent of professionals among them, doctors, lawyers, academics, and that sort of thing. Uh, these were people who, again, gravitated to the cities and became very quickly integrated both into the Ukrainian community and to the Canadian way of life, the Canadian uh, uh, social life very quickly as well. They were, for the most part, a younger generation. They were people in their mm, mid, mid to late 20s, early 30s, uh, who found it uh, nowhere near as difficult to adjust to Canadian life than, for example, the first two immigrations. Now, recently, we have been experiencing in Canada yet a fourth immigration. This is an immigration that's different still in the sense that the first three, the first three immigrations to Canada were very socially oriented in the sense that they built churches, they built halls, uh, there was a very thriving Ukrainian theater scene, uh, Ukrainian dance ensembles and so on, a very active cultural life. The fourth immigration, which has been slowly trickling in probably over the last 10, 15 years, are people who are immigrating out of what used to be the USSR and what is now Ukraine. And we don't quite know what the size of that immigration is, but it is sizable. And it, it's an immigration that, oddly enough, keeps to itself. It's not as active in cultural life as the first three immigrations. So to today, there are probably 52 million Ukrainians living in Ukraine. And there must be something on the order of, oh, what shall we say, between 7.5 and, and 9 million Ukrainians living beyond the borders of Ukraine. Uh, there's a Ukrainian restaurant in Japan. Uh, there's a Ukrainian community in Hawaii. Uh, Ukrainians went to work in the rubber plantations in the South Pacific. So there are Ukrainians pretty much scattered all over the entire world. And what's interesting is that, from my own experience as a Ukrainian Canadian, I can tell you that we, the Ukrainian Canadians, find ourselves to be different from, for example, Ukrainian Americans. Uh, Ukrainian Americans exhibit a lot more of what I would call American culture and American sensibilities than do we, whereas I find that in our community here in Canada, we tend to reflect Canadian sensibilities and a Canadian orientation, which makes us quite distinct from the Ukrainians south of the border. So even though we share a language, and I've, I've been at a dinner table, I, this was in Ottawa actually, where there were eight people at the table and the only common language we all spoke was in fact Ukrainian. There were people there who spoke Ukrainian Spanish, people who spoke Ukrainian German, uh, you know, Ukrainian French, but the only language we really shared was Ukrainian. So here we are, uh, a century later, uh, having been pioneers in Canada, having watched a thousand years of history go by, uh, seen our quote-unquote countrymen, or those we share with in Ukraine, declare themselves independent, and it really comes down to this thing of ethnicity, which I always tend to think of as a combination of inheritance and burden. Inheritance because it gives me a language in which I can live imaginatively. And that's to say the Ukrainian language, which I speak fluently, but also uh, everything from Easter eggs to the, the narratives that I've been sharing with you over the last five programs.
And there's, there is something there which gives me a lot of room for imagination. But a burden, yes, it is a burden, because sometimes one would just prefer uh, to be an ordinary Canadian, whatever that means, you know, uh, to have an English name and to speak English and not to have, uh, and not to have this map and this history and 2,000 years of, uh, of suffering and the guilt and the glory and the grief that has been the story of my countrymen and my countrywomen. Uh, perhaps I would like to make it go away, but I can't. Uh, and so, as a result, I say it's an inheritance and a burden. Uh, something that my parents passed on to me, and who knows, maybe I'll pass it on to someone as well. It's, uh, it's a trying story, a demanding story, but it's also a heroic story. And it's not heroic in the sense that Ukrainians ever built empires, because they never did. Their story has been the story of people who preferred to be left well enough alone because they were fortunate enough to be blessed with a little piece of Eden uh, called that wonderful black soil that they live on. But instead history has thrown them about and it looks like they're about to start on a new historical course in Ukraine. It'll be a question to see what role the diaspora will play in that and to what extent they can build a history for themselves that is really their own and not one that has been imposed on them. Thank you for being with us. I'm Roman Fritschuk. Till some other time. Tim Chasson.